Greetings, my name is Monty Martin and welcome back to Isidoro 101. In this series of video tutorials, I'm going to be introducing you to the core features and functionality of Isidora 3. Today, we are going to build on what we did in our very first tutorial where we learned how to build our first Isidora patch. I'm going to show you how to build that out with a few more scenes and we're going to explore how to build scene transitions that we can control to move from one scene to the next in Isadora. Basically building out a very simple patch that you might use in an actual show if you're making a projection design with Isadora. I'm also going to show you some tips and tricks for managing scenes such as adding new scenes into the middle of your show or even building a small auto follow depending on how you want to work your transitions between scenes. Now, if you want to follow along with me as I'm working here today, I've included a download in the description below that contains a file folder with a few media files that I'm working with here in the tutorial. But of course, you can use your own media files. Whatever you want to create creatively together is up to you. I might work a little bit quickly sometimes, so don't forget that you can always hit pause or go back if you need to see what I said again. If you're all ready to get rolling, Let's power up Isadora and get to work. Fantastic. So I just figured we'll start fresh today and just get a quick refresher on how to import some media into Isadora and build out a couple scenes really, really quickly. I've started a brand new patch. I got nothing here on my scene and I'm going to open up the folder here on my desktop where I've got all my media files. I've got a couple video files that I've selected and I'm just going to select all of them and I'm going to drag them right here into the media bin and they're all going to get imported into Isadora right away so I can start working with them. Now these files aren't necessarily in the order that I need them in for my show but I'm going to take the files as I need them to put them down into the scene list to create my show. Now, what we're going to create is a little bit of a story here. We're going to start out in outer space and we're going to fly down through the clouds and into a city street. So we're going to start off with this video right here of the earth rotating in high definition. So I'm going to drag that right onto my patch. And of course, we want to preview what we're doing as we build this out. So let's go to output for stage preview so we can get the little preview window there showing us just what we're doing as we build everything in here. And then I'm just going to go over along here to my media bin and I'm going to grab the next file here, which I want is this media file here, which is clouds. And instead of dragging this into my scene, I'm going to drag this into the scene list down here where Isadora will create a new scene for me immediately with the movie player and projector already linked together and playing back. So there's my new scene with the clouds. I'm going to do this one more time to get this uh, video here of the city flyover, bring that right down into the scene list. Isadora makes a new scene. Lovely bit of video there as well. Nice drone shot. And let's go and get the last one here of the people walking in the street. Bit of a blurred out shot. Might be in the background of our main scene. So I've got four scenes right here in my show. And I can move between the scenes to edit them by simply clicking on them. And you'll see the active scene is always highlighted in a bright blue there with the other scenes grayed out. Now Isadora has given all these scenes a name of untitled, which is not very helpful for me. So let's go in here and double click on the scenes to give each of them a descriptive name. The first scene here we'll call Earth. Great. And the second we'll double click again and we'll call this Clouds. Perfect. The third scene, we will call this one City Flyover. And the last one, we will call this City Street. Perfect. Now, you'll notice that even though I renamed all of these files, they still kept a Q number and they stay in order. Q1, 2, 3, 4. We're going to learn how to customize what these Q numbers are in just a moment. But for now, I'm happy with that. So I've got all my scenes here built and let's go back to the first scene with the earth. So we can move between scenes in Isadora by clicking, but if you've ever operated a show in a theater before, you know that clicking is not always the fastest or most efficient way of triggering a scene transition. The mouse pointer can kind of wave all over the screen, even in the midst of a show. This is why by default in Isadora, 
Pressing the space bar once always triggers an immediate scene transition from one scene to the next. So let's hit the space bar right now. Boom, there's our scene of the clouds. If we press this one more time, we transition into the city flyover and pressing it the last time, we transition into the city street. Now, because this is the last scene in my project, if I go ahead and hit the space bar again, nothing happens. I don't have any more scenes. Isidora doesn't reset back to the beginning. Scenes proceed from one scene to the next in a linear fashion. So if I do need to reset my show or go back, I will need to click the previous scene. Now, for those of you wondering, there is a technique for creating a back button if you need one or panic buttons in Isadora, but we're going to explore those in our future tutorials when we look at building control panels in Isadora. Now, for now, let's look at these transitions because they need a little bit of help. These are jump cut transitions. As you can see, when I hit the space bar here, we go boom, right into the clouds, boom, right into the city street, into the city flyover, and boom right into the city street. That might not be ideal. Sometimes we might want a crossfade or a gradual transition from one scene to the next. How can we build this out? Well, let's go back to the very first scene with the earth here. And right over here in the bottom corner here is my fade time control. And in this right hand side is my fade out time. And I can go in here and specify how long I want my crossfade to be in seconds. Let's just go with a standard time here of three seconds and press return and that locks that in. Now when I hit the space bar, the earth scene is going to fade out and the cloud scene will fade in. It'll create a crossfade over three seconds. Let's watch. There it is. What a nice transition. Let's do this one more time, creating a three second fade from the clouds to the city flyover. And when I hit the trigger, notice the progress bar that fires when I start the queue. Gives you a nice visual representation of the queue as it's going in progress, so you don't actually ma accidentally mash that space bar too many times in a row. Let's do one more crossfade over here from the city flyover to the city street. Very nice. So that just makes everything nice and smooth and gradual. And I find particularly in a projection design, fades just make things feel much more comfortable, natural, and ease everything in. As opposed to when we're making a video or a movie where we usually want to have just very sharp cuts. Now, this is a great little sequence already. But if we were doing this in an actual show, we might need to put in a couple blackout cues, particularly at the beginning and the end of the show. So let's just create a couple completely blank scenes and put them at the beginning and end of our show. I'm going to go down to the scene list here and I'm just going to click it and you'll notice that a flashing cursor appears and my stage preview goes empty. This is because I now don't have a scene selected. I am going to right click or secondary click and I get the option here pops up to insert scene and a new untitled scene with nothing in the scene, no actors, is created. Now, this scene is a complete blackout. This is perfect for the end of the show, but I also need one at the beginning. So I can add a scene at the very beginning of the show by just, again, clicking right between the two scenes. You'll notice the flashing cursor is right there at the start. And once again, secondary click, insert scene. And there we go. I have one at the beginning of the show. Notice that when I did that, Isadora renumbered all my cues so that they stayed numbered by their scene index order. So the Earth scene became Q2, Q3, Q4, Q5, and Q6 with a new Q1 created. This is the default pattern in Isadora, but again, we can change that. We'll talk about that in a moment. For now, let's just rename our newly created empty scenes, Blackout and blackout. Actually, maybe I'm going to call this one pre-show. Perfect. And I'm going to put a five second fade up time on my pre-show. And now for the blackout scene, I don't want to put the fade time in the scene for the blackout itself. Remember, you always put the fade, the crossfade time in the scene that you're coming out of, not the scene that you're going into. 
So in the city street scene, I'm going to put a five second fade out there now. Perfect. Looks like we're all ready to roll. Let's see what we've created. I'm going to click to go back to my pre-show scene. And now let's fire the cue. Go. Nice five second fade up right there. And in a real show, we might live in the sequence for a little while, but let's hit go. Here we are in the nice, lovely clouds. Let's go to the next queue. Our city scene. Perfect. Let's go to the next one. City street. Perfect. And let's black it out and end the show. Perfect. What a nice way to end things off. That's a lovely little sequence, but maybe we're in rehearsal and we find that we need to build this out just a little bit more and add another clip or video into it. I've got this video of the cloudy city here, and I'm going to put this right in between the scene of my clouds and my city flyover. Maybe add a little bit more of a natural transition there. So let's bring that in and drop that right between those two scenes. And I'm going to rename that one. Now, again, because I just added this scene, it has a jump transition into the next one. So I need to go back to that one now and put in its correct fade time of three seconds. So I added that scene right in there. There's no problem. Looks pretty good. Now, of course, I've got a few more video files in here. Maybe I'll put in this scene of the jellyfish here. Maybe the blackout isn't the final scene of our show. We're going to put the, show, the scene of the jellyfish there at the end of our project. Maybe we're going now to an ocean from the city. And we've got a couple different scenes now in our whole project. Maybe we change our mind later on, though, and it turns out we're not going to go from the blackout to the jellyfish. We're going to go from the city street directly to the jellyfish. So I can actually just drag this and move this over into the right spot in the scene. And we get the right transition there. We might have to correct that now, make sure that the city street has a three second fade and the jellyfish have a five second fade. So our scene list is very, very configurable in this regard. We can click to drag the scenes to move them to a new position. And of course, if we decided actually that's just way too weird, we don't need this jellyfish at all. We can just select the scene, press the delete key, and that erases it entirely. We can also add new scenes anywhere in the sequence to move them around. So it's very, very flexible in Isadora how you build your cues. Just remember that when you're using simple crossfades, that the scene always puts the fade time in the scene at, that you're fading out from and into, not the other way around. You don't want to lose your fades if you're moving your scenes around, adding them, deleting them, removing them. If you are doing a lot of changes like this, it's a really good idea to make sure that you're flashing through all your scenes making sure that everything still has that nice consistent flow that you built in and you didn't build in a new group of scenes and forget to add their fade times if you wanted them. So we've got a lovely little sequence here. This is a pretty simple example of what you might create in a pretty average projection design that is very quick and simple to build with Isadora. But one of the best things about this ultimately is how configurable and flexible the whole process is. We don't need to go back into a video editing application if we need to change the order of these clips or change their fade times or bring in a new clip and put it in the middle. Being able to build things so quickly and flexibly in this manner really unlocks so much more potential when you're working in the room with other performers and artists. So two quick tricks before we wrap up today. First of all, you might want to manually set the queue numbers for your queues in Isadora. If you want to do this, all you need to do is go to scene, queue numbering, and switch it from scene index to manual. Once you've done this, you'll have the ability to click on one of your scenes and renumber the queue itself. When you do this, you can give this queue any number you like. If you try to use a queue that's already in use, however, Isadora will warn you, but you can use any number you want then in this case. I can even have my queue numbers completely out of order, like calling this Q99, and Isadora will allow me to make that change. When we have manual queue numbering enabled, when I insert a new scene, 
Isadora will automatically give it a queue number if I've added that at the end of the project. And when I insert it in the middle of the project, Isidore will ask me what number I want to give that scene. So in this case, I might give the queue number 5.5 instead. This allows you to add sub cues. So if you are in a technical rehearsal and you are working with a stage manager who is writing their queue numbers in their book, I recommend building your Isadora show with Isadora set to scene index mode. And once you've given your queue numbers to your stage manager, switch your entire project over to manual so that if queues are later added, you can put those point queues in manually yourself. For myself now, I'm just going to delete these extra queues that I've added here, and I'm going to switch it back to scene index. Notice when I do this, Isidore is going to warn me because switching back to scene index is going to overwrite all the existing queue numbers in my entire project and switch them back to the raw number that they are in the Isidore project itself. In addition to this, sometimes you may want to create an auto follow in Isidora, a scene that triggers automatically instead of having to be manually triggered. A most common trigger for this is that, for instance, if I just need this video of the clouds to play once and then automatically go into the video of the cloudy city and then automatically go into the city flyover, I can use an actor called jump to accomplish this. The jump actor works a lot like the scene transition. When the jump actor receives a trigger here, it then triggers the scene transition over into the next scene. Now, one way that we can trigger the jump actor is by connecting the loop end of our movie player to the trigger on the jump actor. This is because when the movie player completes playing a movie, as the yellow playhead gets to the very end of the movie, you'll notice that the loop end fires, signaling that the video has got to the very end. So I can connect these together, and now I'll put in a fade time in the jump actor of three seconds, and once we get to the end of this movie, it is automatically going to trigger that transition for me. And there it went. Now, because I'm using video files that don't perfectly loop, that's not a completely elegant transition. It somewhat works in this case because there's a little bit of visual overlap and I've made a bit of a longer fade time. But sometimes you might need to fine tune things a little bit more than that. That's where another actor called the comparator is really, really handy. I'm gonna break this link first so I don't get kicked out of this scene as I'm working. I'm going to use an actor called the comparator for this purpose. The comparator is a very, very powerful actor, but it's got a few complexities to it. What the comparator does is basically looks at two numbers and then it does a logical comparison based on those two numbers. It can either watch and see when those two numbers equal to each other or when the first number is greater than or less than the other number. We choose this operation by using the comparison field. So in this case, it's by default, it's set to equals. And so what I want to do with this is I'm going to actually link the comparator up to the position of the movie player. Notice that the, the movie player shows the position of the playhead as a percentage. So if I use the position of the movie player as my comparison trigger, say when the movie gets over 80% complete, when the comparator sees that, it will then fire a trigger. How do I do this? Well, first I'm going to set my comparator to greater than or GT. This means that the first value, when the first value is greater than the second value, it fires a true or false trigger. I'm going to connect the position to value 1, and I'm going to manually set value 1 to 85. Now, if we watch the comparator, you'll see that once value 1 exceeds value 2, a true trigger is going to get fired. So let's watch and see that as it approaches 85%. Boom, there it was. Now let's go and connect that true trigger to the trigger of the jump. Now what's going to happen is when the movie is 85% complete, our jump is going to get triggered. There we go. 
that was a much smoother transition. I might have to finesse the timing a little bit on that one. Maybe we'll go back to that scene and I'll make it just 75% instead. And maybe I'll just make this um, a two second fade instead. That might make that a little bit smoother. Yeah, much, much better. Now, one thing to be aware of is that when you do do auto follows like this, if I'm in this scene and maybe I've got to add another effect or I'm changing something else, maybe I'm changing the intensity or some of the other properties on the movie player, just be aware that the scene is now going to kick you out automatically, just like that, after a few seconds. So sometimes it might be necessary to pause the Isadora engine so that you can make changes. This can be particularly the case if you've created a scene that only lasts for one second now. So I'm going to go to Output, Pause Engine, and these red bars surround the Isadora window indicating my engine has been completely shut down. This means that the movie players are stopped, the triggers don't fire, nothing is going to be working in Isadora, and so I can go back into the scene of the clouds, make the changes that I need to make, and then I can go Output, Resume Engine, and now Isidore will be working properly again. So if you do get yourself into those situations where you've created some sort of autofollow and you can't edit your scene, pausing the engine is the fix that you're looking for. All right, well, that wraps it up for today. Be sure to leave a comment below if you do have any questions. And if you want to learn even more, we've got lots of great videos right here on YouTube in our series, including the Guru Sessions with Isidore creator Mark Coniglio. We also have some helpful links in the description below to the Troikatronics website and our community forums where you can find even more useful resources. Thank you so much for joining me here today, and we'll see you at the next workshop.